Okay, I'd start telling people because we're going to go live on YouTube in about a minute. Okay, so um, welcome to our meeting tonight. So I'm going to keep everyone on, on mute um, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions in the chat. Well, you can ask the questions as we go through, as you think of them, but we'll, we'll cover them towards the end of the um, interview. Um, and then I, I'm going to do an intro to open labour, but I'll, I'll wait till we go live on YouTube for that. Sorry, Rachel, I asked you a question. Um, I missed the stuff about uh, questions. Are they going to be via the chat or like this? Yeah, so uh, everyone will be muted uh, during the meeting and then ask questions via chat and then we will get to them at the end. Thank you. We're, we're streaming now, Rachel, so you can start any time you like. Okay, so I just want to give a little bit of an introduction to Open Neighbour for anyone who is... Oh, I'm on mute, everyone. Um, Alex, do you know how to, to mute all people. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to give a little introduction to Open Neighbour in case you've got any people who are new to us. Um, so Open Neighbour is a membership organisation of the Labour Party. Um, we are we were set up um, to stand for socialist left wing um, politics and very internationalist politics, but we believe in a pluralist party um, that's based on policies, understanding, the, uh, getting the best out of all factions in the party. Um, and being based around a leader. Um, and uh, we've got members across the country. Uh, in the last year or so, we've launched local groups and we've got a number um, all around uh, the country. We've recently launched London, um, Scotland, various ones. Um, so we've got quite a, a wide uh, base and we're trying to, if, if any of you want to get more involved in that, particularly as we exit lockdown, we're keen to set up more groups um, in more places so more of you have the opportunity to get physically involved. Um, I'm Rachel Ward, I'm one of the co-chairs of Open Neighbour um, and uh, that goes really covers it. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, we have Stephen Bush um, from the New Statesman. Um, hello Stephen. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I want to just sort of start off with um, a question about um, obviously we've had a kind of big week in Labour um, or last two weeks with the leak uh, the leaked uh, redacted port, uh, report report um, and I, it's 
it's sparked a lot of debate um, in the Labour Party and it's often said that the Tories uh, get a kind of easy ride in the press um, and are under less scrutiny uh, than Labour. I wonder if you think that the report kind of illustrates maybe that the Labour right sometimes get an easier ride, um, if you think that would be fair um, and what your thoughts were on it. Um. So although I think the, the left does play on a harder difficulty setting in, in the press, I think primarily what the report indicates is that media law is that media and data protection law are really important. Well, as I say, really important necessarily implies that I think that the, the media law as it currently exists in the UK couldn't be improved. Media law and data protection are really important existing constraints on what journalists can and cannot write. And indeed, on what you and indeed beyond the, the confines of what journalists can and cannot write and say, in what anyone can or cannot write and say, um, with the legal certainty that they won't end up uh, in court. I think one of the things I found interesting about the response to the coverage or lack of coverage of that issue, right, is that, um, you know, people often talk about conspiracy theories on the left, but in many ways, what this has revealed is people who lack a theory yeah like there's a conspiracy but there's no theory right like you know when i um say then it seems to me unlikely that within corbyn's office there wasn't someone who was an asset of the british security services i'm not saying that because i have because i think one of them has opinions that could only be held by a cop i'm saying that because throughout the history of british politics and the british state um, the security services have, uh, you know, infiltrated left-wing movements, you know, and spied on left-wing politicians pretty consistently. I mean, Harriet Harman had a phone bugged uh, in, in the 1980s, right? That, that is a theory based on how state power acts. And I've been really struck by, like, the number of people uh, who sent me, sometimes polite, sometimes very aggressive messages, based on the idea that what shapes my coverage is that I'm friends with people who are a decade older than me, whose moment of relevance uh, within the Labour Party did not exactly coincide with, with my uh, journalistic career, um, rather than this existing thing called the law, which of course in its current composition does protect various interests and make it hard to express things. I mean, I, I think, you know, I do also think some of the legal reasons why coverage of that report has been muted are very important protections of the rights and individual uh, the right of individuals they aren't just about uh, the, the defense of existing power but yeah look the primary reason uh, why um, why coverage of that report has been quite muted is is bluntly it's not because in a, a difficult time for the media ecosystem then we haven't thought you know it'd be wonderful more left on left beef. Um, like the most reliable underpinning of, of, of the NS's financial health basically for the last century. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, that, that it's not about a kind of a media bias that does, I think, in general exist, but I just think it's not a particularly useful lens to explain that story. Yes, yeah, so kind of on the other side of it, um, some people are saying that the report kind of feeds into this, um, the stabbed in the back myth, um, and for a lot of people explains, okay, that's simple. That's why Corbyn didn't win in 2017. He would have, but for this, this undermine, um, uh, this undermining him in HQ. So what effect, or do you think it will have an effect? Um, it will it have on the party going forward. Do you think this will be forgotten or is forgiven? Um, or do you think this is going to be like a sort of seismic moment that defines how factions play out in the coming year? I think, to be honest, the thing which will define the future of the Labour Party will be the success or otherwise of the Starmer project. And sort of everything else is kind of re is kind of redundant, right? Um, in that you can't, you can't sort of understand why Keir Starmer is a leader without an understanding of how Corbyn's project played out, right? Which created the sort of political conditions in which um, the kind of, if this makes sense, the most, you know, kind of Starmer's success in some ways is, and he was like 
the 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 most right wing in a Labour sense politician who was still authentically a loyalist within the overall project. Now, obviously, if you're someone who's meat and drink is like the granularities of different Labour factions, you would both probably strongly critique the idea that Keir was on the right of the Labour Party, and you might also strongly critique the idea that he was an unquestioned loyalist. But I think in terms of the average, um, less politically engaged Labour member than the average open Labour member or the average New Statesman reader or the average, re- you know, like the kind of sort of median Labour member whose engagement with their membership is a bit like my engagement with my membership of like Kew Gardens, right? Like, I, I think for that type of person, like Keir's strength and appeal was that he was the kind of, yeah, the most right in politician within the tent almost, right? He, he both was someone who was going to protect the things they hadn't liked about 2015 that had changed, but then broadly would give them a quieter life. And so the future of Labour's faction fighting is so dependent on what it is that members want at the end of the Starmer era, right? They might want someone who will turn the page on, you know, six failed years of Starmer government, right? That's possible. Um, they might want, um, you yeah, they might be picking an incumbent prime minister. Um, they might be um, picking someone after a fifth successive defeat. And, and all of those variables, I just think, are so much more important than really, to be honest, any internal Labour row that will happen in his, in his leadership, right? The, 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 le- the internal rows matter in so much as they contribute to the success of Starmerism as a political endeavour. Oh, you've got to mute, I think. I've gone mute or you've gone mute. Now I can hear you. Okay. Oh, can right. I? Yeah. Oh, I think it's, I think you just weren't speaking. Um, I think there's a time lag with your video. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting you talk about the success of his project and Stalmerism. It doesn't feel, I think, yet like that is very obvious what that is. Um, I mean, even even I think with Ed Miliband, I think it was clearer what what that was supposed to shape up to be. It was a kind of breakaway from like Blairism, um, kind of continued by Gordon Brown. I don't think that that's necessarily as obvious to to the public or to what it yet will shape up to be. And I know that we at Open Labour have expressed previously some some concern that whilst obviously Keir Starmer has this like really broad support um, as demonstrated by the result, um, and he's obviously got quite a strong backing in the PLP, we're concerned that maybe he won't have so much, um, he won't draw so much organisational strength from other elements of the, the Labour Party. <laughs> And uh, uh, I wonder if you think that this kind of thing will become a problem, will become a problem. Um, whether or not, sorry, I'm getting a lot of echo, <laughs> whether or not like it matters that um, he is primarily kind of strong in the, the PLP, if you agree that he is, or whether or not he can kind of bypass members and that kind of dynamic of, you know, okay. like, Organisational strength coming from members is kind of is kind of few members matter basically anymore in terms of organisational output. Um, well, so I guess start, I'll start with the, the the easiest part of that, which is uh, of course members matter because ultimately, right, the the political success of his project is entirely dependent on can he get NEC buy-in for his project right and I mean there are a lot there are lots and lots of things that um contributed to Corbynism's um electoral and, and political failure but one of the things which was a, a sharp limitation on Corbyn's freedom to maneuver is even when he had an NEC majority he only had one NEC majority right like the more effective you are the, you know, like your effectiveness as a Labour leader increases exponentially the more different ways you can get to whatever 36 half plus one is um because if you can get to it by doing a deal with 
um, the representatives of the lay membership on one issue and with the GMB and the, and the trade unions on another or with councillors and members on another, then you're, as Labour leader, you're both more powerful, but you'll also have greater flexibility. Whereas Jeremy Corbyn's majority only flowed through the um, organised left of the party and the trade union movement, which meant that on an issue like, say, Heathrow expansion, um, something which obviously he and his shadow chancellor historically opposed, uh, they were unable to um, to form another majority because, although of course there were people who were allied with him on other on that issue, when it came to issues like who was going to be parachuted in somewhere or how you change the rules on this or what party policy on an issue would be, he would always have to return to that original alliance. So members have a huge importance because they are one of Keir Starmer's roots to um, to an NEC majority. I guess, however, I would strongly dispute the account of Keir Starmer in two ways. One, one ultimately, Keir, you know, Keir literally got elected in a landslide by Labour members at the start of the month, right? Like, um, and I, I think there is there is no compelling evidence uh, that. That, that that dynamic has, has changed in, in a meaningful way. I think the interesting thing about, like, so obviously voters don't know what Starmerism is because most of them don't know who he is, right? You show them a picture and they're like, oh, I know who that is. That's David Cameron, probably, right? Or like, you know, they, they don't know who Keir Starmer is, right? The interesting thing is when we talk about how Labour members or politicos or the media don't know who Keir Starmer is, that's because essentially Keir keeps telling us and we're like, but are you really, though? Like, Ultimately, Keir has been very explicit, right, that he, and indeed, I would argue his shadow cabinet further underlines this, right, this is essentially politics from, you know, whether you want to call it the soft left, or as I would call it, the middle of the party, right, this is, this is, this is fundamentally uh, a kind of Millibandite cabinet with the benefit that Ed never had of him, of Keir having multiple choices for plausible shadow chancellors, and he's picked uh, very plausible to have a chance to an analyst Dodds, who broadly share that type of politics, right? Whereas Ed Miliband's great difficulty was that there were two overwhelmingly qualified candidates in that parliamentary party, um, uh, perhaps three actually, and you count Stephen Timms, who's kind of sort of a forgotten talent in some ways, but there were kind of three plausible, two plausible talents in terms of his position in the parliamentary party uh, and the ability to do that quite difficult job. Yvette Cooper and Ed Balls, both of whom were to, to his right. And that was quite a sharp limitation on his uh, ability to, to deliver uh, Millibandism, if you will, um, kind of coupled with a kind of genuine, um, you know, to, uh, the professionalism could be an ideological value. I think it's actually really important in terms of understanding Keir's thought, right? Then for him, like having a campaign team, which includes included, you know, Matt Pound, Simon Fletcher, Kat Fletcher, Morgan McSweeney, was not just about like, oh, my gift to various bits of the party, of the party's traditions will be, they all get, get one. With the exception of a couple of people who either decided that, you know, they, they wanted to stay in their quite nice uh, private sector job, or they were gonna, you know, try and try and sort of get the Nandy campaign off the ground, or if they were gonna work for a long way, with, with a handful of exceptions, Keir really did have a kind of who's who of the... Yeah, I think like it, it, it's very easy to go, oh, that campaign sniping was about positioning. But he also did broadly pick the best person in the, those positions, right? Like, he, like, I just think Keir Starmer's revealed preference is to hire people who are in the middle of the party uh, and or are very talented, um, probably actually with the order of preference running slightly in the other, other order. But when he's... And you see this when he recruits to people who are obviously to his left or his right, that they are very much a kind of like, oh, right, you're a round peg in a round hole. But I think there's this slight weirdness that because, because Keir looks like a Blairite, right, he looks very polished, he's got commanding third way hair, um, then everyone kind of goes like, oh, but like, really, of course, you're going to pull off the mask and suddenly be like, I'm intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich as long as they pay their taxes. 
And I just don't think there's any evidence and that is true. Of course, one of the slight weird things about um, the last couple of weeks of story is that I suspect that it will mean that when we look at his first set of personnel choices in HQ, people will not be able to go, oh, he chose to do this ecumenical and talented approach because that's the broad through line of his politics. They'll kind of go like, oh, well, that was also what was politically feasible. But yeah, I just think a large chunk of the kind of we don't know who Keir is, is just because like um, everyone in my industry, and I include myself in this, we're so um, inculcated to be cynical about it that we kind of almost ruled out the idea that like maybe Keir is just what Keir presents to be. Yeah, I think that's fair that he's not really had a proper chance and it's true that, you know, he's telling us what he stands for and it's just he's not always believed. I guess my concern is just that, it's just that. I think under Corbyn we had an unprecedented situation where you had, um, like if members didn't agree with something, it could actually shift the outcome. Sometimes we're good and sometimes we're bad and what happens. And I guess there's that feeling that that power, that power increase rather than that the members are at odds with Keir. It's that if they become at odds with it, they don't really have it. They don't really have it. Um, I'm just going to mute everyone. I'm just going to mute everyone. Really uh, uh, I think one of the things I'm finding fascinating about the kind of early days of, of, of the Starmer era is, is watching a Corbyn who, to be blunt, does not bear much relation to the Corbyn I remember covering, uh, coming into being, both actually uh, among kind of Corbyn skeptics outside the Labour Party. Um, yeah, like this kind of way people are like, oh, you know, wasn't his first PMQs very quiet and orderly and, and not like the usual. It's just like, I, I distinctly remember people saying that about Corbyn's first PMQs. Or, you know, people kind of getting very cross about, um, uh, Keir Starmer uh, wishing the Queen a happy 94th birthday as if somehow there's something more seditious about doing that for the 93rd, 92nd, 90th and 89th birthday which Corbyn did as opposed to when Keir does it, it shows that he's really a fraud um, but I mean ultimately like Labour Party members yeah I, like there's lots of there's lots of very good stuff in the Green New Deal but like if you look at the Green New Deal as it arrived in Labour's manifesto and as it came through the conference floor, or if you look at the policy on, uh, you know, on free movement and expanding it across the, the, the world, ultimately Labour members were important under Corbyn, partly because he himself genuinely believed it, although as a project I don't think you could always fairly say that the leader's office or Corbynism in practice did, but members did have what they'd asked for explicitly turned down on multiple occasions and I don't think that that balance of sometimes the members will vote something it will get decided sometimes the members will vote something and people will go oh lol Labour conference what are they like and sometimes the leadership will do deals with the affiliates the trade unions the councillors etc etc to get what it wants I think one of the interesting things is and I think a lot of the time when Labour politicians say Wilson is their favourite Prime Minister, what they really mean is I like the idea of winning, but not like Blair did. I actually think with Keir, what you will see is a genuine sort of more Wilsonian approach to party management um, in which you have deals done here with that bit of the party, deals done with that bit of the, par the party, and where what the end result is, is a manifesto than... Um, and a manifesto and platform that is broadly aligned with him. Uh, and I, yeah, particularly think you really do see an, a, a sort of preview of how his approach will be in terms of how he's brought in Corbynites and, you know, genuine Blairites uh, into the front bench and the positions he's given both of those traditions. Okay, so sort of okay, keeping on sort of kind keeping of... Oh, I'm getting terrible echo. I wonder... Stephen, if you could mute for a sec. Oh, sure. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, so keeping on kind of like theme of factions and and relating to Keir and how he deals with that, I wondered what you thought uh, the lockdown means in terms of 
how Keir will emerge. And I don't so much mean like his reaction politically to the situation. I mean, the actual fact of like the lockdown putting on ice kind of quite a lot of political activity. CLPs aren't meeting. The Shad Cab isn't really meeting. And does that kind of create this sense of calm and uh, like not not a lot of like organising uh, like that can happen either for him or against him? Or um, do you think it creates problems for him, for example, not being able necessarily to like build those relationships and alliances within the PLP that he might, I mean, I know he's obviously strong there, but you'd normally expect during this time that you're starting to like get to know the people you've just appointed and he probably doesn't have that opportunity. I wonder what you, you thought that, how you thought that might impact what happens as we come out of lockdown. Well, yeah, I mean, I think like the, the personal relationships, right? Like, so obviously there are, there are lots of people in this, um, you know, the thing I found really striking, right? To, to open the veil into one of the least attractive aspects of being a political journalist. One of the things you always do whenever there's like a cabinet reshuffle or a shadow cabinet reshuffle or a Lib Dems cosplaying session, um, you, um, you text people going, oh, congratulations, richly deserved in the hope that they will then ask you, when you ask them intrusive questions, they will be more inclined to, to say yes. And the thing I found really striking about that exercise this time is how many people in that shadow cabinet said, oh, thank you, and I'm really glad that X is there, and oh, and it's so nice to have so many colleagues from X thing or Y thing, right? Like, so it's actually, as shadow cabinet, as current cabinets go, right, it's actually quite a tight group from a personal level. Right, like um, in the in the same way, then although there were political differences between the three leadership candidates, they all got on quite well. So I think then that cost, which I think is a real cost, right, is that yeah, you know, the fact that yeah, like they're not going to have an away day anytime soon, um, is less of a problem than it would be. Um, I think in terms of sort of the personnel stuff, right, you can already see that he has the benefit, right, like yeah, the the, the biggest single defeat. For Corbyn in terms of his chances of ever winning an election happened 12 years before he became leader in 2005 when basically not a single um, kind of great hope of the kind of Labour left got through in a seat that they were then still in by 2015 and that meant that he had a very shallow bench and he had to do essentially right for a lot of the Corbyn era the effective front bench was maybe five or six people, right? Whereas now already you see this thing where, you know, you turn on the television and there's like Ed Miliband saying, why aren't these loans guaranteed to 100%? Of course, small businesses aren't going to get that. You have um, Liz Kelly going, why are social, why, you know, why is... Uh, Sorry, if, if everyone's minutes to cap, then obviously we encourage that. Sorry, Stephen. Sorry, why are people oh. clapping? I don't understand. Oh, of course. Tim, in the Tim is uh, in China. Um, in the UK, uh, people are clapping every eight pm. The NHS. So lots of people going to that one. Going to that one. Well, was it every day now? I thought it was like every Tuesday or something. Every Thursday. Fair enough.
Just give it one more minute. Okay, I am gonna resume the questions. Um, Stephen, I don't know if you had anything you want to add to what you were saying before, or you want me to move on. You want me to move on. Oh, yeah, sorry, I guess my like I think that the biggest impact of lockdown, right, is going to be that it perversely, in one very important and immediate way, is going to make British politics more normal again. Which is that when we emerge from this, we will once again have a Conservative Party, um, in which at least a large chunk of it, right, even if um, its leadership decides, you know, actually you don't have to worry about debt in this scenario. For, and there are, there are, I say this to someone who didn't think that the res fiscal response to the last financial crisis was was the right one either. But there are, there are lots of good reasons, even if you were someone who was concerned about government debt in 2010 to be more relaxed about the debt the government has taken on this time, right? Even though it's a larger sum, there are other reasons to be less concerned about. But I think it is highly likely that the biggest change of lockdown from Keir Starmer and the British political party is we will once again have a situation in which politics is uh, an argument between a conservative party making an active argument for um, some form of austerity, whether it's spending cuts or, or hefty tax rises, um, and you will have a Labour Party making a argument for a different approach to uh, an economic downturn and crisis. Um, of course, there's an open question about whether or not that battle will have a different conclusion to the one it had before. But it does, I think, mean that polit political discussion will be about something quite different than anyone really anticipated it was going to be when they voted in the Labour leadership election or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so on yeah. that note, um, and kind of moving away from like the Labour Party specifically, I don't know if it's just me or it's um, a feeling lots of people have, I, I get the impression it isn't just me, but I kind of feel like we are living in interesting times, but boring political times, at least compared to the last 10 years. Um, and I wondered if you thought that, um, do you think people are interested in political questions beyond coronavirus at the moment? And also, are, are people interested, do people see the questions coming up because of coronavirus as political questions? Or is it just this disaster that has befelled us and we all have to just pull together? Like, is, is this a kind of political space in terms of the way people perceive it, whether, not just how it actually is? So I think people have quite a nuanced position on this, right? I think you can see that in the polls, right? Now, on the one hand, throughout the democratic world, unless you've visibly shat the bed, right? Unless you're Trump or Abe, where in different ways they have done something which has caused their voters to really stand up and go, I'm really unhappy with you. Basically, everyone else is seeing their opinion poll ratings go up into the stratosphere, most popular, yeah, they're breaking records, you know, decade long, decade long records. I think the interesting thing here is you have a situation where the average British person both thinks that the government was too slow to lock down and that the government is handling the crisis about right. Now, I think there are a couple of reasons for that, and I think that they all speak to the like slight broadness of people both do and do not see this as a political moment, right? In the same way, like, I don't know if you, if you ever had like an argument, if any of you ever had with, like an argument with your partner when you're like at their parents or at a house party, and even if you think that their complaint is legitimate, you're like, why are you litigating this now? Could we not wait until we're out, out of this insufferable house party and then we can have this row about your sister? Like there's an element, I think, with some of the political debate that you can kind of see broadly than, because essentially, right, the public tells us and they quite overwhelmingly think a couple of things which are hard to reconcile with each other, right? They have doubts about the handling. They're angry about, they're angry with journalists for asking too many lead questions. And they're, and they are, and they think the government's handling it well. And it's like, well, okay, those, those, those things can't all coexist with one another. 
And so I think there's an element of people want the, they want the terrible house party to be over and then they'll have a fight, right? I also think there's an element to which actually people are, you know, in political journalism, everyone gets so excited when the government makes a U-turn. But I think mostly people tend to take the view that they're like, okay, you've listened to me and you've changed, you've changed the thing I want you to change. In, in some ways, right, it's a bit like if you order something and, like, it's wrong and then you phone up and they send you the right thing or you're in a restaurant, you know, that thing that people used to be able to do. Um, and, you know, like, and the meal arrives and it's not what you've ordered. People don't get angry and walk out of the restaurant if it changes and it's quite painless. They only change, get annoyed if they start to feel that the, the reason why it's happening isn't the person who is uh, U-turning is incompetent or in some way, you know, in some other way sort of, Flawed. Now, I think the interesting thing is at the moment, right, the public broadly is like, you've U-turned and I'm happy you've U-turned. They don't, they both don't, I think, accept the idea that this is about incompetence, but they also don't want to have the row yet. And so I think in lots of ways, the challenge for the opposition parties is one, obviously they have a problem that they are all in different ways co-authors of the government strategy, right? Like, you know, the Welsh Labour government pursued the same strategy. The, well, I was also the Welsh Labour Liberal Democrat Coalition in Wales, right? So, so those two opposition parties have been involved in this. The SNP government in Scotland has been involved in this, right? So they've got two challenges. I think the first thing is they have to work out what are the things they are going to say now in a time when they're not really going to get that much of a hearing. And the only thing that the kind of the overwhelming, the sort of the best case scenario is a like vague impression that like isn't the shadow chancellor like a nice Scottish woman, and that being broadly the only thing people have absorbed about the Labour Party, you know that kind of positional stuff. And then the second thing is what are the things they are doing so that when people are out of the horrible house party and then they are like, okay, well now we can have the row. How is the Labour Party and other opposition parties best positioned to have that horrible row? Just realised I've been speaking for ages with uh, my mic on mute, typical. <laughs> and what I was going to say is, um, yeah, so as well as this kind of like challenge both for members of the public and journalists and then also uh, opposition parties about, you know, when is the right time to challenge and what to challenge. I think there's been this like real issue and I think you um, were discussing it on the latest episode of the New Statesman podcast as well about how journalists cover the crisis and the failings of it and like knowing what questions to ask. And it strikes me that this is like a recurring problem with um, medical crises. Um, and it, it happened, I think a lot in the AIDS epidemic. Um, it has, it's been an issue with things like um, chronic fatigue syndrome where you get this kind of like tension between like experts and and doctors and scientists and stuff and then activists um who are like and, and the people affected um by a crisis knowing when to push against kind of like scientific advice and like knowing where the line between kind of evidence-based decisions and uh political decisions is um and so i guess like what has this been like for you as a journalist and like how how do you think people can, uh, who are not experts, challenge experts in a productive way and understand kind of where the line between evidence and political judgment lies and like know the right questions to ask? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. Um, and it's something, you know, like from a personal level, I, I'm struggling with it and I don't necessarily think we've we, we definitely haven't reached our final answer and it may be that our kind of interim answer, as it were, is, is not the correct one at the publication. I guess, for me at least, right, there's the, the, the easy part is, is you just cover the daily announcements as daily announcements, right? 
um, where you go, okay, well, you've announced 70, 750 million to support charities. We know that the, the black hole is 4 billion. So how's that work? But yeah, like, how does, how does that cohere, right? That's kind of the sort of easy stuff from a journalistic perspective. From a kind of overall citizenship perspective, right? Um, as you say, right, the historical um, lesson, you know, not just from HIV AIDS, but in general from medical crises, is that um, the political tariff for failure is actually basically non-existent. Um, the governments which uh, were led by science and compassion over HIV AIDS did not noticeably receive any benefit from it compared to governments which were led by homophobia, dogma and fear. Um, I think the useful kind of thing is like is actually to imagine imagine not for a moment we're talking about a country's illness but one's own, right? I think the way to interrogate the science is partly to kind of like the type of questions one would reasonably ask of one's doctor, right? So let's take say masks, right? The sort of er example, right? Now, actually, there are now a number of studies showing that the medical consensus is, is definitely moved on, on the issue of masks, right? But the reasonable question is like, okay, well, we are currently saying that the science is uncertain. Why do we think, therefore, that France, Canada, South Korea, Japan, et cetera, are wrong? Also, given that, like, you know, I don't want to depress anyone unduly, but um, probably this is not going to be the last pandemic any of us lived through. Um, they're essentially seen is generally one every decade or so, and some of them kind of vanished like a damp squid, but SARS did. Some of them um, are yeah, kind of sort of wiped out of kind of popular history in the way that, um, than, than, than HIV AIDS uh, ha has been. And then some of them, uh, I mean, also I was about to say some of them, and I don't actually know what the historical remembrance of, of COVID-19 will be. Um, but Oh, I definitely did have an eloquent point at the end of that. But but oh yes, of course, masks. But of course, what they have in common is that they happen fairly regularly. So actually, as a general bit of public health, people wearing masks outside in outside in public places is is a pretty good idea, right? Like it can't hurt. Um, Provided, of course, you're not doing it in a way which upends your healthcare system's um, provisions. And I think it's one of those things where with masks, the position I've decided works for me. And I think this actually, I think, does read across in terms of the like, what should the opposition parties do? Because in the end, right, if you're uncomfortable doing something, you, you never come across well, right? It's basically, for me at least, the position I, I've decided I am comfortable in is going, well, look, here's what the evidence says. Here's the reasons why it should. Here's actually the, the reason why governments might feel worried about healthcare capacity. Is that why, right? And in many ways, right, that's the kind of conversation you'd have with your doctor, right? Um, you know, if you're ill and you're recommended something and someone else who has it recommends something else, what you say is you go like, okay, cool, I respect and you know what you're talking about, but, you know, why am I on that and not that? Um, and I kind of think that is probably the right approach. But I say that and I'm very aware of the fact that, as you say, um, visibly no one has ever got the politics of either opposition or the media in a pandemic right, because otherwise um, governments would not I, would, would be rewarded or punished more. And, and the evidence is that they very rarely are either way. I think it's interesting because, I mean, the masks example is really interesting because it's a real challenge to know how to report it because there's, I think a lot of the decisions that the government have made, which uh, are not necessarily that logical or don't seem that logical at the time intuitively. And then they've like, you um, have been issues where they've made the decision based on a kind of, and a guess of how people will behave. So it's not necessarily about like science. So like, yeah, it would be better if everyone had a mask, but it would be worse if everyone thinks they need a mask and then they go and panic by masks and then there's a mask shortage. And that's a really difficult space for how do you report on that? Um, because it's not, you, ha you can't just do it on a kind of like fact basis. Um, I, I, I don't really have like a, a, a question on that, I guess my kind of, 
my feeling is like there's just not enough kind of understanding in the public or like in curriculums about how public health works um yeah I don't know what you think yeah I don't know what you think but I mean or indeed in government right like yeah I, I genuinely think one of the things that um that is clear to me at least and I think you know there's a very good column by James Forsyth in the spectator which kind of you know shows a, a similar thing then it, when people in government talk about the science right that unfortunately isn't people who understand that that is not a thing trying to spin the voters that is people who, who genuinely do seem to believe there is such a thing as the science as opposed to varying degrees of certainty and uncertainty um, and they simply haven't computed that until um, relatively recently. And it's difficult because you have a political class, both in terms of the people who are making the decisions who don't understand it, and a political decision who, um, and, a, and a political media class, which mostly isn't that very good at understanding that or conveying that, scrutinizing it. And I think the weird thing is, is I think the coverage of the government's been deeply unfair has been rooted in a lack of understanding about the fact that science is uncertain and the coverage which of the government which has allowed the government off the hook has been rooted in a lack of understanding that science is uncertain right the the root cause is the same and this is why and this is not i guess well i guess in terms of your overall project as an organization devoted to pluralism this is an important part i'm going to plagiarize something from dan davis the author of the book uh, lying for money which is a very good short history of fraud um in which he was just like Look, i don't believe that a politics in which you have a woman leader at any given time is necessarily healthier, but a politics which gives birth to more women leaders tends to have better political outcomes overall. And I think actually the same issues of a talent pipeline that mean that uh, yeah, Labour has never had a woman leader, um, the same dysfunctionality which means that Westminster as a whole does not have as, uh, as many women MPs as it arguably should by a head of population, is the same reason that you do not have, um, you know, I mean, I love Chion Wura, but the question I always have is why is, she, why is there only one of her, right? Like, it's not like there aren't loads of engineers who have political opinions. Whenever I send morning call out, I get 45 emails from engineers complaining about the state of politics, right? Like, you know, like, I, I think, you know, kind of, if you, you know, like, with Merkel, right? Yes, she's a woman, but I think also equally importantly, she's a scientist, and she's a scientist in a political culture where a scientist talking like they're a scientist does not have people going, oh, look at that nerd. Whereas, you know, like, I think Rishi Sunak and Ed Miliband could both explain exponential growth in as eloquent a way as, as Angela Merkel did, but I'm pretty certain that the papers would not be that favourable, uh, uh, even to Rishi Sunak, and certainly weren't to Ed Miliband. And I think that increasing the... You know, basically, if there were more scientists scrutinising this, and there were more scientists who were ministers, I think we would be in a better place. And in terms of building pandemic resilience, both in terms of the political class's ability to, to scrutinize it and our ability to weather these things, which are going to happen to us every couple of decades, increasing the number of, um, you know, the number, you know, the kind of skills pipeline, I was about to say into politics, but obviously the specific issue you're concerned with is, is the PLP, is a central way to do that. Sorry, should I be reading the questions or are you gonna field them or? I mean, I can read them obviously, I can, I can see them here. Can anyone hear me now? They're just frozen. All oh, right, you can hear me, brilliant. Um, yes, no, it's odd, I've forgotten that Alex was of course on the call, but I do think Alex is right to say that like, who was, yeah, Alex Obel, in case you're not reading the chat, did ask about track and test. And, yeah, and, you know, and does, has a, has a non-arts qualification. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do in, until uh, Rachel uh, either yells at me or something happens is just read uh, your questions. 
uh, and and just kind of pick the ones that I feel equipped to answer slash complain about the fact that my computer's scrolling function is terrible. Um, 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 will Keir Starmer make Labour's problem worse? Appeal to the comfort zone, the public sector workers, middle class students, BAME voters and urban dwellers. Um, you know, how can he do a blue Labour revolution to appeal to the voters, part, party voters shed in 2010, 2015, 2017, 2019? Um, so I guess I'm, yeah, I think like it, it, it's, it's worth noting, right, that, that Labour's recent high watermark with voters outside of its traditional core of uh, its traditional core voters was with a bloke who went to the Scottish version of Eton and Oxford and then it, its electoral nadirs have come under two Etonians and ironically right the, the politician who in many ways was like the most like the voters that Labour has lost was Theresa May, and she failed to win the 2017 election, right? Um, so I kind of think the, the biography stuff doesn't matter all that much. And I kind of think, right, the, the, you know, and one of the, one of the problems, I think, with having your leadership election when you did, is it's still not actually that clear um, what went wrong, right? Uh, I mean, I think there are some very obvious headline problems, but I'm not necessarily convinced that those headline problems are that useful to you to know what went wrong, because like, ultimately, like, if, if the answer is, like, don't have a leader as unpopular as Jeremy Corbyn in 2019 and don't oppose Brexit, well, I, I don't think that neither of those conditions are going to apply next time for a, for, for a fairly obvious reason. Um, but because... Yeah, because for those kind of time-based reasons, you ended up having this leadership election before it was really clear exactly what had gone wrong. Um, you, um, you of course have this situation where um, say, you of course have this situation where um, where you don't know for certain what the right approach is. I think ultimately, you know, like to say something I said a lot during the Corbyn era the first commentary on your ability to win a general election is to your ability to win the party selection. Um, so um, I think he's broadly shown he has those, the correct instincts to do that, which was a serious campaign based around recruiting some of the best people available to him and knowing exactly what the territory of the electorate was, which I think are the central, the central challenges before you now is like, you know, is the party more professional? Have you recruited the best people? And if the answer to both those questions is yes, then I think kind of everything else flows from that. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll okay, come in so and take I'll, over I'll, the I'll chair. Come in and take over the chair. So, uh, so um, uh, um, Hi. Hi. Alex, I think you stole me. You stole me. Sorry, technical Wi Fi. Technical Wi Fi. I'm confused if I'm. I'm confused if I'm eight shorts. I'm going to bring you behind him to ask a question. There you go, Liz, you're muted. There you go, Liz, you're muted. Oh, 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 I wasn't expecting that. Hi, suddenly. Yes, Hi, suddenly. Yes, a lot of, a lot of in chat about, do we need more science journalists? More science journalists. Challenging things like, yeah, the things like, yeah, what my is is utterly all over the place. It's all over the place. It's a time that we've had to write about science. Write about science. And question them. And question them at the... Um, 
so I, I guess I'm I'm slightly um, cynical about the the value of it for the basic reason that like the average science journalist isn't a scientist either, and it is ultimately a political. Like these are fundamentally political decisions. Like you know, the, to what extent you know you believe the the you know like the question of can your healthcare system handle uh, having uh, can your healthcare system handle having uh, you know loads of people wearing masks who weren't before is ultimately a political question. And so I think I, I used to at the start of this crisis very much be someone who was going there need to be more science journalists involved. I think that broadly the thing is, is right, the, the questions have to be grounded in science and politics. I, they have to be people who are interested in policy. And I think in general there is a structural problem that um, political journalists tend, journalism journalism tends to over-index for interest in, like, who's up, who's down, um, which I think is to be honest, a way of covering politics, which is only really effective and useful when one party has a majority in excess of 100 and therefore all that matters is the inner life and internal drama of the governing party. But it's not a particularly useful way of covering a contentious political issue um, to have more, more science journalists rather than more political journalists, which did very much used to be something I, I thought would, would solve uh, the problem. Um, um, Stephen, so I Stephen, so I through um, your question earlier, my internet connection. Um, uh, I had some more questions, um, and then I want to go back as well to some of our members' questions. Um, I think you touched on we've touched on it a little bit already, but I wondered whether or not uh, what kind of ideological like opportunities you thought that the crisis presents Labour, particularly as we come out of the crisis. Um, people are comparing it to World War II and the kind of the settlement that came out of that. Do you think that the Labour Party is in a kind of space where it has enough ideological coherency to have answers um, uh, to what's happening now and what, what after? Lots of people have been talking about things like UBI, um, but I think, you know, there's also just questions about like inequality. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, so, look, I guess I've always thought that one of the reasons why Labour, well, I probably haven't always thought, but like one of the reasons why Labour was able to win a landslide in 1945 is it had two benefits. One, which of course was in, was in office, right? It had proven it could govern by governing. Um, and then the instruments of war in terms of the home front were things that it specifically wanted to turn towards peace. Now, so I guess where I'm slightly cautious about the idea and this is an, op an opportunity is what, what levers of the COVID-19 response would the left like to stay and how would it envisage using them? Um, and it, I'm not necessarily saying that there aren't any answers to those questions which say, yes, it is an opportunity to the left, but I think that that's kind of the core of, is this, an op is this a specific opportunity, is what policy levers that Rishi Sunak has pulled in this process does the Labour Party want to stay, and that it thinks will be popular. Um, if the answer to the first one is some things and the answer to them is none, that doesn't mean it shouldn't advocate for them, but it doesn't mean that that's not really an opportunity, right? I suspect, maybe wrongly, that um, one of the interesting long-term changes of this period is it will further accelerate the trend whereby working from home used to primarily be a demand of workers. is kind of now a demand of both workers and bosses and will increasingly just become a kind of like demand of bosses who want to divest themselves of the expensive office space. Um, but I broadly, to be honest, think that the central political opportunity for the Labour Party is that I think it is likely that we will embark again as a country on another programme of austerity, 
when broadly, right, I think there are loads of reasons why austerity became more difficult to deliver after 2015, some of which were to do with the changes of the Labour Party. But I still think that the central problem was that by 2015, they had, they had used up all of the tax cuts that you could do, sorry, all of the spending cuts that you could do without any voters going, wait, what the hell's happened to my services? And I think you know, it's the biggest opportunity is to um, try and refight the economic argument for cuts versus investment in a situation in which the cuts will be more painful because like, they just, they, the political conditions for another round of austerity I just don't think are there. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I just want to I just want to echo again. Uh, uh, thing. Um, I want to bring in some of our members' questions again. Um, so we had one earlier from Harry Scoffin. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that all right. Um, will Keir Starmer make Labour's problem worse by restricting um, appeal to public uh, restricting our appeal to just public sector workers, BAME workers, young urban dwellers, and kind of connected with that, um, uh, I can see Nathan has uh, asked, uh, how can Labour win back voters in Brexit voting towns? Um, so yeah, will, will Keir make our problem worse um, in terms of demographic profile or can he have more broad um, appeal? So I, I, I answered the key question when uh, your thing went down, but I'm going to do the Nathan one, which is that I think, um, I mean, I, I, I primarily do not believe that your problem in towns is a problem of towns, right? The moment, so the moment in which it became very clear to me that the Labour Party was going to lose was I was on my way to Wakefield, in which um, I was I was on a council estate. And this woman stopped me and she was just like, oh, you're something to do with politics. And I was like, yeah. And she was like, she's like, oh, I'm not voting Labour. I hate Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, you know, he's terrible. Um, he's weak and I want to leave. I just want Brexit to be over. Well, this woman lives two floors down from me on my estate in Stoke Newington. It's just that she's like above a certain age, wanted to leave the EU and is, um, you know, and it's, kind of is, you know, socially authoritarian or whatever sort of phrase you want to, want to use, right? Like, the difference is, right, is that Diane's vote going down didn't matter because there are still loads and loads of um, of uh, sort of Labour, of, you know, of demographics which stuck with Labour, some of them very reluctantly, but, you know, they still did it anyway. Um, and I think that a lot of the time the problem with Labour's town's discourse is it becomes a way for you to go like, oh, wow, that person didn't agree with us on immigration and they didn't agree with us on tax either. Um, but maybe the issue is transport policy. Maybe we could tell them about how great our existing buses policy was. And I just, I just think I ultimately, I'm not necessarily saying that means you need to move towards those voters, but I do think that you ultimately do have to decide whether or not you're going to concede on those issues or convince on them. But the one thing that is not going to work is going, hey, I hear you disagree with us about a high salience issue. Can I interest you in the fact that we agree on a low salience one? And I think where fundamentally Keir, if, so if Keir loses, it will not be because of where he's from. It will be because of the things he said on the stuff that people actually really care about, either because he's failed to convince them of the, the when they disagree with him, either that doesn't matter or he's actually right, or because he has to, positions and worldviews and are alien to them. But yeah, I, I just think like broadly, um, you know, as, as the great Arsene Wenger says, it's about values, not passports. And that's as true for successful Labour leaders as it is for successful footballers. We have um, another question and this is from Tom Lang. Um, and it's, what do you make of uh, the way uh, the deputy leadership role is viewed by Angela Rayner and how her and Keir are working together, especially compared with uh, previous Labour leaders and their deputies, um, uh, notably Corbyn and Tom Watson, who had a poor working relationship, I think would be safe to say. Yeah, I mean, 
the Labour, the deputy leadership is often a good example of how if you ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. Uh, this isn't like that sounded like I was a veiled attack on the question. Um, the question's a very good one. Um, in the if you have a contest in which so I chaired one of the Labour hustings, I mean, I and basically every journalist around, there were so many of them that, you know, by the end, I think some people had chaired too. But literally, the, and when I was given the questions to choose from, at first I went, well, I'm not going to, yeah, I, leadership question, very easy. I had this kind of, you know, mathematical thing of, I piled all of the questions together by genre and basically made sure that a question from all the higher piles got answered and then tried to have a variety of questions from the lower piles as well. With the deputy race, I kind of sat down and I said very self-importantly, well, I'm not going to field any questions that aren't about the role of deputy leader. And then you realise after, and there may be like this, maybe like one question about, you know, making Labour Party conference family friendly, one question about making the run party run, one question about like, you know, how you'll support the leader. And then like, there's just question after question about like, you know, what's your view on the top rate of income tax, which last time I checked was not an issue that either Tom Watson or Harriet Harman or indeed Angela Rayner were going to adjudicate on. One of the interesting things that I'm told Tom Watson contemplated doing towards the end of his leadership is his time but did not do was to basically say he thought imbalance the role should be abolished because it just introduces institutional um, institutional inertia. Yeah, so it, yeah, you just you build in by having someone with a, a second a second mandate but no power. All that's going to happen is they're going to have beef with the Labour leader. Now, I think, to be honest, I think broadly that is structurally true. I think that every so often, and if you look at the, if you look at the number of times Labour has had a healthy institutional relationship with its deputy leader, it's been very rare. I think at the moment um, it is the case that Labour does have a deputy leader who has a kind of more healthy conception of the role. I think that's partly because you have a deputy leader who's very young and very talented and therefore probably at some point likes the idea that they will move up um and is of course um acting in many ways as his kind of enforcer on the issues of party reform internally while doing very clever things herself to build her own power base but i think the problem almost regardless who occupies it is it's an inherently dysfunctional thing to do to elect the deputy um as a role it does i mean the, the irony then what the irony, right, that the one use of the deputy leadership role is in a scenario like the 2019 election, and yet he didn't have one, and even if he hadn't been standing down, he probably would have lost his seat anyway. Like, and it just kind of underlines, like, what's the point? Um, if, if, if the issue is, is sometimes you need a situation where someone can take over um, for an indefinite period, like, actually, like, the leader should just name the shadow secretary of state. I just just think that ultimately, well, it only builds dysfunctional dysfunctionality, and you're actually quite lucky that in this situation it hasn't. But that's solely to do with the personality of Angela Rayner. Um, it, it is just not a good way of running the top of a party to have those two roles elected in that manner in that way. Yeah, I. I kind of tend to agree. Um, I don't really see the point in the role. Um, I have to say, I don't think it's very well defined and it, I think that causes a lot of problems. Um, of another question, I guess kind of connected. Um, do you, this is from Omar Salim. Do you think the internal culture of the Labour Party has been particularly bad recently? Like, I guess in the, the context of the Labour Party history of all time um, and uh, what scope do you think there is to improve it? Um, I mean I think you know that the Labour Party I think as an institution has deep and long-running problems right um, it yeah, all, all parties are unhappy but I think the Labour Party is, is often a uniquely unhappy way often cursed with bad faith, um, blighted by cronyism. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I once, I say once, I've said loads, so I once said, you know, um, if you wait long enough, the joy of covering the Labour Party's every possible fact position is held by every available faction. And when I coined it, I said, usually you have to wait about five years, a length of time, which I realised was wildly optimistic, right? 
usually it's about five months. And I think, you know, I genuinely think one of the unavoidable difficulties in a party like Labour is that because it's a coalition of various interests and the only way you balance that is to have a democratic settlement than, you know, if Amnesty International were doing a sort of, is this party, you know, kind of like one of those indexes of democratic freedoms, the Labour Party would be in one of those ones where everyone goes like, is that country really a democracy? Well, it's arguable. They don't arrest journalists, but, you know, the elections are mostly free, right? Like, you know, it would very much be in that bracket, right? But because ultimately, you know, you are a kind of coalition of trade unions and friendly societies and liberation campaigns. I think to maintain that distinctiveness, um, there's always a tension there between that and being properly democratic, right? Like ultimately, if you decided everything, one member, one vote, you know, if you decided to basically be like the Lib Dems, well, like you'd, you'd be a left-wing party, but you wouldn't be a union party anymore. And, and for many people, that is quite an important part of the the Labour tradition. Um, so I really don't know what this, whether or not Labour's institute kind of overarching institutional problems can be fixed or if they're inherent in the creation. I mean, I think one of the, you know, obviously at the moment you are having an investigation by uh, internal people uh, that has an unhappy reason. But I do think, not least because it's one of the things I would always love to do if I had infinite money, infinite access and infinite time, to get an anthropologist to look at the internal health of the Labour Party and work out how it could be improved, right? Because it is obviously, I think, just a deeply toxic and dysfunctional environment. Um, and I think one of the ways you would fit one, well, I mean, like when a business has a dysfunctional environment, they pay, admittedly, over the odds, sometimes for a very poor standard of service, but they get someone to come in from outside and go, why do you do that? Why are all these meetings awful? And then they propose something and they take it forward. Now, of course, because you are a quasi-democratic party, any proposal would then have to be voted through. But it feels to me that one of the logical ways to fix some of the problems and broadly everyone fair-minded in the Labour Party, you know, kind of from Corbyn there and Blair there, agrees exist, is surely to get someone from the outside to look at it and be like, is there a way this could not happen? Yeah, I mean, I I often think about the comparison with like businesses and our culture, and I think for all of like the we can criticize like big corporate businesses for being big corporate businesses that do bad things and stuff, and maybe don't always treat their employees super well. But like, I do often think in terms of like culture, like I know I prefer being at my office than I do sometimes in the Labour Party because you just wouldn't be allowed to say the things that you can say in the Labour Party and uh, people wouldn't wouldn't tolerate everything being taken in such bad faith. So it's, I think it's quite an interesting comparison. Um, I guess kind of connected to that and the, and the investigation, um, David Kempler has asked, um, can Keir succeed in repairing Labour's relationship with the Jewish community and what can Open Labour do to help the process? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, yes, he, he can, right? And, and bluntly, right, there are, there are two pillars to that, right? The first pillar is kind of the lever everyone gets excited about because it's big and dramatic and also because loads of people hoping it'll be used against people they dislike, is expulsion, right? And that is going to be an important lever, right? There are people who should not be in the Labour Party who need to not be in the Labour Party. However, like, ultimately, you can't, like, basically, broadly, right, the, the issue is solved, not when you have, like, the NEC sitting there going, like, and shall we vote to kick out so-and-so, and everyone voting yes, and, you know, they have eight-hour meetings, and then eventually they can go, it's over. It's when a large group of people voluntarily self-deport, to use a particularly horrible phrase coined by, I think, Mitt Romney, but, like, is basically just for people to feel, you know, not to feel unwelcome because people are rude or nasty or do any of those other sort of toxic labour things. But like broadly, right, the, the number one thing that open open labour can do um, is to vote for people who are genuinely committed to removing anti-Semites from the Labour Party. Um, like 
you know, so one of the reasons why I don't particularly like the term soft left in a modern term, right, isn't, isn't ultimately the point of being on the soft left was an alliance of people who were to Healy's left, who voted for him because they believed in the values they shared with him were worth sacrificing their own control. That's not a, and it reaches its logical ap apotheosis with a bunch of people to the left of Blair voting for Blair in both the parliamentary party and the membership in 1994. Well, the soft left now runs the Labour Party, so it is no longer acting as a soft left. That's just the middle of the party running the Labour Party. Um, but the one sort of aspect of soft left thought that is important and really vital if you're going to meet that promise to the Jewish community is you've just got to be willing to prioritize removing anti-Semites with advancing politics, advancing other politics, right? Like you do have to accept that um, you have to have a realistic idea about whether or not you sincerely believe you're voting in a way that is going to let lead to this being removed, right? That, that does have to be the primary focus of any, uh, you know, alliances for any sea slates, any of that stuff has got to be absolutely rooted in. Um, are we certain that the, these are people who will or will not go, oh, well, it's the cost of doing business, right? Because that's essentially, right, the root of your problem is not the people who agree with the sentiments that have been expressed, but who people who've decided it's, it's fine and it's the cost of doing business. Ditto the kind of cross-factional failure to deal with sexual harassment or bullying, right? The problem is not that the Labour Party is awash with sexual harassers and bullies. It's an, it is awash with people who are like, well, you know, if we pull this thread, maybe so-and-so will get deselected or maybe I'll lose my NEC majority. And I think that is actually where the pluralism and the kind of historical tendency of the soft left is so important, vital, is, like, is, is to genuinely be anti-that as your kind of sort of first political demand, really. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and does reflect what we're kind of about and what we're trying to do. Um, ben, uh, Brad uh, Baines has asked, um, what do you think Labour has to do in the 2021 elections, local, mayoral, Scottish Parliament and Welsh Parliament, for Keir to have succeeded in his first electoral test? Um, and I'm going to kind of add on to this, like, do you think Keir can win the next general election or is, is the situation so bad that it realistically he can't? Um, so I, I absolutely think Keir can win the next election. I mean, I'm, I can, I want to make it very clear that I'm at this point specifically going as in like it is logistically possible, right? Um, voters are incredibly volatile, more volatile than they've ever been before. Uh, they are more willing than they've ever been before to vote for parties they've never voted for before. Um, and you see that, yeah, actually, right, the story of that can be told in Red Car, right? Seat which was solidly Labour from its creation until 2010, when it voted Lib Dem on a massive swing. Then in 2015, it votes Labour on a massive swing. Then in 2019, it votes Conservative on a massive swing. And that's broadly the story of British voters, right? So I think an electoral defeat, which you'd have looked at and you've gone, look, with the best will in the world, this is a two-term proposition. I don't think that is true anymore. So I think it is possible for Labour, if it makes the right political decisions and it has the right political headwinds, you know, the stuff that it can't, you know, can't control. I think, of course, it's possible for Labour to, to win the next election. In a way, I don't think it was even possible for David Cameron to necessarily win the 2010 election. And indeed, he did not win the 2010 general election. What would Keir have to do for the next, for the 2021 election to be a good one for Labour? I mean, so obviously the challenge here is we don't know um, when this line, because basically the, the moment I would say to worry about the polls as they currently are is the moment when um, when they're no longer normal, as it were. Yeah, like at the moment, like these polls being like 52% of people vote conservative. Yeah, like basically they're like they're the polls you change the channel. They're true in every country basically around the world. So I think if that's still the case, I'm not saying that it means you shouldn't be worried about it, because it would, of course, mean that you're like on course to do quite badly. But at that point, you sort of have to kind of accept sometimes that there are just problems, things there aren't, there are problems to which there aren't solutions. And I think one of the things which often causes political party a lot of pain and unnecessary civil war is when they 
and because you're built as an institution to not go. You know, these things like ultimately, maybe the solution on Brexit was not to have a situation in which the parliamentary arithmetic meant you had to be collaborators in whatever emerged from the process. Like maybe that just was maybe that was just an unwinnable scenario. Um, I think broadly, right, we, we know a couple of things. And the, the positive things for Labour for it to be a good local election is to um, to win a majority of the metro mayoralties on offer. Um, to make real gains in the seats that you do not currently hold um, and to consolidate in the seats that you held or held narrowly. Um, I think that, that, that broadly is to me a, a good, ele good local election night. Um, of course, you know, the, the flip side, the other important thing there is and what we really don't know is to what extent are some of those elections entirely separate dynamics, right? I think we kind of accept now that like, I hope we kind of accept now then like your problems in Scotland are not going to be solved by any one leader down in London. Um, and it may be that a similar dynamic means then, yeah, actually like the elections in London and Wales also follow their own rules. But yeah, I think that's probably what I'd say was successful. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Um, no, thanks. Um, kind of connected with the kind of like what are Keir's tests. John Jones has um, asked, many of us paid a lot of attention to Keir's first PMQs. In what ways do you think PMQs is or isn't important? Um, and I think that's like important for us as Labour members to like judge our leader. Um, and what should we keep in mind um, when watching and reading about PMQs? So, so PMQs are kind of sort of two and a bit functions, right? Its first function is it keeps the parliamentary parties happy, right? Like, um, you know, like broadly, the 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 evidence that Ed was good at it was not just that when you look back broadly, he and Cameron, the where, you know, when people kind of did the who won, they split 50 50. It was despite the fact that he was not the choice of the majority of the PLP, he went through the whole of his leadership without facing. With, yeah, without being removed and without facing, I would say, a particularly serious or well-organized attempt to get rid of him. And that was because he did well at PMQs whenever he needed to. And he did well at PMQs most of the time. Ditto, David Cameron, who throughout most of that time, we shouldn't forget, um, faulty polls suggested he was going to lose, went through a period in which the only person to seriously talk about challenging him was Adam Afriyi, a man who I suspect most people went, who the hell's he, right? And again, that was because he was quite good at it, right? So they matter in terms of parliament because they stop people getting arrested. In terms of what, you know, how they matter to the country and how they matter to the Labour members, well, that kind of comes up to the other thing that they do. The other role of PMQs is they're a really useful political stress test for the political parties, right? And you saw that, um, you saw that on, on, on Wednesday, right? Like, Rob can't answer any of the questions about, about care homes and PPE because the government has no good answers. And that means if you're the prime minister, the value of PMQs for you is one, it's a, it's a stick to beat the Department of Health with in this instant, right? You can basically say if you're the prime minister, geez, I'm getting turned over by Keir Starmer here. When am I gonna get some better answers on this issue? Fuck your ideas up. Um, but two, and this is less useful because obviously we all knew that they had a problem with care homes with PP anyway. But two, it, it's useful because it exposes those problems. If, if you are the prime minister, the value of PMQs is if it turns out and you're like, oh God, I can't go out there and defend Minister X, that means you need to get a new Minister X. Um, now, the thing they also exposed, right, is ultimately like, you, you do have, I mean, I'm not necessarily certain it's a large problem because bluntly I'm not convinced that people in Wales particularly care all that much about the, the, the record of, of the Welsh Assembly. Um, but ultimately, like, you do also clearly have a problem in the one of the things PMQs exposed is like Rob's safe place was to go but what about how Welsh Labour is handling this and I think the useful thing with PMQs right is because it does stress test the vulnerabilities of both sides the thing for you as members in terms of assessing whether or not you think your leader is delivering is that if every week it turns out that the leader of the Labour Party has the same strategic vulnerability and they and they just don't do anything about it that's a sign you need to get a new leader right like if, if, if every week it's like, oh, this PMQs has exposed this strategic weakness and the Labour Party just won't tackle it, then like, you know, 
you at that point need to be writing to your MP asking them like, we would like to vote again, is I think broadly uh, the use of it, because it, it is a way to stress test a leader's vulnerabilities. And it's crucially a way to stress test whether or not a leader is interested in improving their vulnerabilities. Because I think one of the problems a lot of politicians tend to have is that obviously to become an MP, you've already been fairly successful. And then to become more successful, you need to add new skills. And lots of them will tend to kind of go like, oh, but I think maybe I'll double down on my old ones. So yeah, that is essentially its value to, as an institution, its value to you as members is like to go, is the, is the leader tackling their weaknesses or are they just like every week, like going, hmm, maybe if I ask about X, this won't happen. Now, of course, sometimes some weaknesses just can't be dealt with, right? Like ultimately, um, one of the structural weaknesses Keir is going to have is, Either the background harm of the next five years will be him having a fight with getting rid of anti-Semites, or he'll be having a fight about him having failed to tackle the problem. Um, now, obviously, I think that the fight about getting rid of them is, is a fight that is worth having, but it is a strategic vulnerability that means that whenever you want to ask Boris Johnson about divisions, he will always be able to go, well, you're divided too. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the value of it. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll stop rambling now. Okay, and then our last uh, question from, I've copied it, yeah, from Matt Carter. Um, do you think COVID-19 crisis is a tipping point in public engagement with politics and the public uh, will become more aware of politics and the world around them? Um, um, it's a really interesting question, um, which I actually haven't put any thought into. So I'm just going to think out loud and then hopefully I'll stop. Um, so, right. Essentially, from a, you know, from a kind of from the from the part of the world I know, which is new statesmen, uh, readers and subscribers. Right. Uh, as with pretty much every media organization, COVID has been this weird semi disaster in that more people are reading it and subscribing. But, you know, the, no one picks up on the newsstand and we definitely need more subscribers because the advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, which is kind of like Brexit, except Brexit was, I was about to say pain-free. Brexit was emotionally painful, but from a subscriber perspective, it was all win-win-win, right? Um, now, I guess the thing is, right, is those people who um, got very politicised in Brexit are still politically engaged now, right? And in some ways, they're politically engaged in a positive way. You know, loads of them have joined Labour and the Liberal Democrats. I'm a big believer in being a member of a political party is a hugely important part of active citizenship. So I'm very pro people doing it. So, so clearly it's had a lasting impact in terms of civic and political engagement among some people. And, and a bunch of committed leavers have become more engaged and active in the Conservative Party as well, right? And they've continued to, and that subscription boost of people signing up to, you know, the New Statesman, the Spectator, the Economist, Brexit card, uh, have, yeah, they've continued to remain politically engaged. Now, some of them have dropped off, but they've continued as a whole, which means I guess I think that broadly, some of the, yeah, I mean, just from a mathematical perspective, right, logically, you'd assume that two thirds of the people who are paying more attention to politics because of COVID-19 will continue to pay more attention to politics after COVID-19. Um, so with the huge disclaimer that I hadn't thought about that question before, and that's just my kind of like first draft impression, I think I do think that it will result in a permanent uptick in the number of politically engaged people. And actually, yeah, no, the more I think about it, the more plausible that seems, right? Because like those people who were politicized by the Scottish referendum, yes, some of them returned to not voting in 2015, but broadly more of them have kept up the habit than we would expect if the referendum hadn't happened. And so I think essentially any event like this slightly increases the overall pool of politically active citizens. So I guess that is one unalloyed positive from this moment. Okay, just before we go and wrap up, I just wanted to ask one little question before you go. So obviously you're a political journalist um, and you a lot of your reporting has historically kind of, I think it, it seemed like it's come from like speaking to MPs and like getting the goss in uh, Westminster. I just wondered how um, being under lockdown has actually affected like how easy it is to do that and do your job um, and whether, you know, maybe it helps it, maybe it hurts it. Um, do you feel like you're as in the loop as you, you used to be? 
good thing about lockdown, right, is that on the one hand, it's never been easier to talk to MPs, right? Like, you know, they're stuck at home, starting to climb the walls, desperately becoming more annoyed by the sound of their children's chewing, like, you know, like everyone else. So on the one hand, right, I, I have never, ever had fewer... And the thing I have found weird, I'm, 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 I'm still used to this idea that when I want to speak to someone, there's a 50% chance that it'll go to voicemail, and so I'll just leave and send a could you call me text, right? And so I keep having this thing where it's like, oh, oh, you're, you picked up. I'm, I'm, I'm in a talking mode right now. So on one hand, they're more available than ever. On the other, right, like, the, the, so the thing I think is really problematic is, like, in terms of the, like, you know, the kind of um, what is Keir Starmer's thought, what, what are the animating principles in Downing Street, what does the cabinet think about X? That stuff has never been easier. Um, the one difficulty is, is because it's never been easier and because it's all by phone and, and very traceable forms of communication, you definitely have to do more work, not because it's harder to speak to them, but because broadly, you sort of have to assume that you have, you, I'm having to work much harder to protect my sources, basically. Um, and the real difficulty is a large part for me of how I would check whether or not ministers were any good or not is by talking to civil servants. And now you really feel like it's very difficult to do that in a way that doesn't expose them uh, if a story is bad. So it's odd because the like, um, the problem is, is, is the bit of the job that has traditionally driven readers and subscribers is still very easy. The difficult thing is the thing that to me is the most important is harder because yeah, it is much, you know, like you, 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 you do always have to be aware of the need to protect your sources. And obviously you're not protecting your sources. If, um, if like, you know, someone talks to you about how their ministers crap and then like when there's a leak investigation it's like oh why did you speak to Stephen Bush for 45 minutes so that bit is hard and that is um yeah I mean like it's kind of like the debate about the virtual parliament like you sort of have to accept that it's something we're gonna have to do maybe for a while but you also have to be aware that there's no way for it to be done as well um yeah so I guess it, it's it's easier from a logistical perspective, but more difficult from a like source protection perspective. The other way it's more difficult to you know, do another sort of unattractive insight into the lack of critical journalists is that you can't buy people off. I don't mean that I would literally bribe them, but like, let's say I'd write a piece going, so and so achieved nothing at the Department of Transport, and they'd send me an angry, they'd phone me and be like, I can't believe you forgot my partnership for rail users. And in the past, you just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Um, why don't we talk it over over lunch? And then it stops shouting at you because everyone likes free food, right? Whereas now you're like, I'm really sorry. Why don't we Zoom? Like, it's, you can't make people, MPs, not be angry with you by offering to Zoom them. Um, so that, that bit is definitely more difficult. And so I guess it's weird because I realise that both the most um, important bit where you get people to tell you things that power doesn't want has become more difficult. And the most sleazy bit, i.e. the bit where you buy people food so they'll stop being angry with you, um, has become very difficult at this moment. So I guess I'm hoping that at some point I'll start learning which deliveroos there are in like people's constituency and being like, the takeaway is on me. That's a really interesting insight. Um uh thank you for that um and thank you for everyone who's joined the call apologies for technical difficulties world of zoom um yeah so thank thank you i do we have any i'm going to unmute alex do we have any other shout out events that you want to promote yeah we've got the quiz tomorrow night and then on Saturday, we've got an event on Scotland. What, what lessons can we learn and what's the road back in Scotland? Actually, we're very pleased that we have our first Shadow Cabinet member joining us, which is Ian Murray, obviously, Shadow Secretary of State of Scotland, with former um, MP Paul Sweeney, Rhea Wolfson, and Eva Murray, who's Chair of Open Labour Scotland, on Sunday. And then we've got Jermaine Jackman on Tuesday, in conversation with Jermaine Jackman, um, who recently ran for the NEC in the Bain Place and is a former winner of The Voice. So, you know, a bit of stardust in Labour on Tuesday night, again on Zoom. And, and, and um, you should have in your inbox the, the links to join those. And encourage your friends to watch them on YouTube. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, and I'm also being reminded in the comments uh, to uh, recommend everyone listens to the New Statesman podcast, um, where, where you can hear more delightful insights from Stephen Bush's uh, delivery uh, sources. <laughs> um, so, thank you. so thank you. Again, I'm just closing the Zoom. Have a nice evening, everyone.